Now, hear the good news and be not afraid. Good morning. Welcome to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father PJ, good morning. Good morning, Father. Good to have you here in this Easter time that many of the good news from the Lord still continue to motivate ourselves. Let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of mercy, who give us St. Damien, a shining witness of love for the poorest and most abandoned, grant that by his intercession as faithful witnesses of the heart of your Son, Jesus, we too may be servants of the most needy and rejected. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let Amen. us continue. So the Holy Mother of the Church invite us to one of the very famous uh, saints, may I say that, in the current world, many movies have been inspiring this person for us, Father Damien de Veuster. Right. So St. Damien um, was a Belgian priest who famously missioned on the Hawaiian island of Molokai, uh, which at the time was a leper colony. And so when he volunteered as a, as a, as a very young priest um, to, go, to go on mission to this place, he knew in a way, like most missionaries when they leave home, know that they're leaving home for good and the possibility of returning is pretty remote. Um, but, uh, uh, but they like to be told you're going to live on the same plot of land and never leave the Island for the rest of your life is, is the kind of thing most people simply never have to face, but he volunteered for it and was happy to do it. And he knew that if he stayed long enough, he would likely contract the disease himself, which he ultimately did and is how he died. So he lived a sort of long-term martyrdom over the course of several decades tending to the poor and the sick on the island of Molokai. It's very interesting because how many ex excludents manner had been acting in the current war, not only about uh, illness like a uh, leopard in that time, but also currently in terms of violence, poverty. You know, this is a very interesting uh, saying that enlightens us to be more in compassion and charity about those kind of people had been excluded for the for the normal life, may I say that? Right. So, you know, the, the, the problem of excluding people because of disease, of course, goes back to the very beginning, probably, like whenever humans first figured out that if you stand by the sick person, you can get sick too. Right. But, um, but some diseases were considered worse than others. And the, and, and the kind of leprosy that uh, Father Damien's people, um, that Father Damien worked with, uh, is known today as Hansen's disease. It's not clear that this is exactly the same thing as what the lepers were in the time of Jesus. There are oh. a number of different skin oh, conditions that have gone okay. by the name of, of leprosy. But, um, but what it always sort of connotes is a, is a bad, disfiguring skin condition that freaks people out enough Oh, that you, that, care. that you that that you I, that you isolate the sick people, um, and so uh, so um, this this disease was rampant um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, especially in the South Pacific, and so the place where everybody would send their people that had the disease was the island of Molokai. It's uh, very interesting, even that each illness had been deformed, the face, disfigured the face of the person at the body as well. Illness like the leper that you describe could be worse than that, you know, creating the people certain prejudice, any kind of evil, devil possessions or devil attack. But those disfiguration show us the necessity to only see the face of God through those kind of disfiguration, you know? You know, one of my favorite images, um, there's a picture which is very easily findable, like our our. Our listeners could very easily just Google uh, St. Damien and Blessed Marianne because there was a, a sister that eventually came to work with him, Blessed, Blessed Marianne Cope. Um, there's a picture of Father Damien shortly after his death. So Father Marianne and another sister have prepared his body for burial. Hmm. And it's, it's wild because it's a photograph, but of two saints, the dead saint laid out ready for burial and the sister who's just prepared him wow. for burial. Um and and what's stunning about it is, so Father Damien obviously has had the disease, and he looks quite disfigured. I think he's missing a finger or something, and his face doesn't look quite right. Um, uh, uh, but Mother Marianne has not yet, and so she still looks sort of radiant. And, and the contrast between the two is 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 remarkable. At the same time, back to my mind, all those. Uh doctors, uh, nurses that have been attending and facing different kind of uh, illnesses, frustrations, and people in pain. 
and help us also to understand the necessity to be more in solidarity and compassion for all those that working in the hospitals as well that have been facing different phases from God as well through the pain and illness as well. That's exactly right. One thing uh, probably is worth saying, because the, the way I said that a moment ago was potentially confusing. So so Mother Marianne, who has subsequently um, been canonized herself, um, uh, never did contract the disease. And I think what's interesting about this is, you know, we can see sort of in the uh, the the progress of science and the progress of holiness not um, in competition, right? Right. So Father Damien was there several decades before Mother Marianne arrived, and uh, they just didn't understand how the disease was transmitted as well. Then she knew better by the time she was there. It was mostly from the uh, sort of the the pus, the stuff inside the sores that was the real source of the, uh, the, so she knew how to keep herself clean better is what I'm trying to say. Right. right? Um, uh, it's a similar thing, right. With St. Aloysius Gonzaga who tended the plague victims. He ultimately died of, 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 of the plague, but other, other saints later, um, when we understood better how the plague was transmitted, knew how to keep themselves safe. Absolutely. And those moments it's when God is more present. That's right. With, it's when, when God has been acting through us in terms to loving them in that condition. It's easy to love somebody that is completely healthy and muscle and athletic. But when somebody is in that kind of indefense and a very fragility moment is when the grace of God flourishes. That's right. I had a, a, a parishioner recently who had to spend some time in a care facility who was not who was who has never been in that position before and is not permanently in the care facility. Oh. And uh she was she was relating an experience um that was very distressing but I but I think really captures this well. Um you know, like a lot of people uh who who are recovering from something she needed help using the restroom because she couldn't get herself around well. And the the poor uh nurse's aide that was helping her was like eight and a half months pregnant. Well, every time she'd go to help this woman in the restroom She'd get sick because she was so sense. Her own stomach was so sensitive right now because she was, she was pregnant. And the and the and the 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 woman who was in the care facility, the patient, felt very badly about this and kept apologizing and apologizing. And the and the pregnant lady said, "No, this this is how I love." And wow. see, this, this is a great gift here that you know it's it's like it's not like we're it's not like Father Damien went out to get leprosy so that he could be disfigured and die. That would be a sin, right? Correct. But he was willing to risk harm to himself for the sake of caring for others because caring for the other was the prime value and not the self. And, and, and seeing not just the distinction there, but seeing the turn, right, to being other-centered is really the goal of holiness. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes Scotty McCreary with special guest Ali Colleen. And give myself five. Sunday, July 24th at the Iowa Event Center Ballroom. I'm in between Friday night wild and quiet Sunday morning. Tickets and information available at celebratecountry.org. Sponsored by Ball Team. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Established in Des Moines in 1924, St. Vincent de Paul assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient by helping to remove roadblocks on their journey out of poverty. St. Vincent de Paul helps with food, clothing, and shelter, while also offering classes in financial literacy, high school completion, career readiness, and prisoner reentry. Shop, donate, volunteer, serve. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul, svdpdsm.org. This is a segment about small Catholic innovations that made a huge impact from the OSV Institute for Catholic Innovation. There's another saint besides St. Nicholas that shaped Christmas as we know it. St. Boniface was an 8th century bishop sent to catechize German pagans. One of their winter traditions was to decorate an oak tree and perform a pagan ritual around it. Boniface did not approve. He chopped down the oak tree in one fell swoop. Behind the fallen oak was an evergreen. St. Boniface decided to preach about Jesus' gift of eternal life. The Germans were amazed, maybe by this Jack Bishop who chopped down a huge tree in one go, but mostly by Jesus. They put decorated evergreens in their homes to celebrate the birth of Jesus so you can thank Catholic Innovation for Christmas trees. Learn more about what OSV Institute is doing to inspire and encourage Catholic innovation at osvinstitute.com. 
Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by the Sarah Vocations Ministry, including the St. Sarah Club of Des Moines and the Sarah Club of Council Bluffs. Sarah is an apostolate of the Worldwide Catholic Church dedicated to fostering and supporting priesthood and religious vocations. Sarans strive to accomplish their mission through prayer, fellowship, and service to the bishop priests, sisters, and all in religious formation, and in doing so to increase their own holiness. Learn more at joinsara.org, join S-E-R-R-A dot org. Thank you, Sarans, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Before the break, you are closing that moment beautifully. How we can love somebody in a very fragile conditions only by the grace of God. And now, this coming uh, Friday, we have Our Lady of Fatima, a tremendous, tremendous example of love and tender for the world. But at the same time, some people, when speaking about Fatima, just looking about the prophecies, about the secret message, things like that. But let us... Uh, talking about more the maternal, the maternal presence of God, the, our Lady of Fatima, what we can expect in, in this intimate relationship with God through the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I think there are two things that are worth noting. Um, the very first one, right, is that um, the, the, there is a tendency in, um, in some very devout Catholic circles to treat prophecy, and especially prophecies attached to Marian apparitions, different then the church treats prophecies in the scripture, which is a, a not a good move. <laughs> like that's like the, think, completely misunderstand. Think with the heart and mind of the church here, right? So the prophets of the Old Testament were not simply soothsayers or weathermen. They weren't just future predictors. In fact, they were explicitly not that, right? And soothsaying and fortune telling was forbidden. So, so, so th- that in principle is already off the table because it limits human freedom and doesn't allow us to trust properly in divine providence. Rather, the role of the prophet was to unveil or reveal, which is the original meaning of the word apocalypse. Apocalypsis is the, is the unveiling. So, like, think about the, the chalice at Mass. When the deacon or the priest lifts the veil off, that's what a revelation is. He's revealing the beautiful thing hidden underneath. So, so the purpose of prophecy or revelation in the history of the church is to unveil the face of God for his people and the pathway to holiness in the particular moment. So in the Old Testament, that happened primarily by way of the conversion of the people and pointing toward the coming of Christ. And in the new dispensation, which is what we live in, it's in bringing people in a closer relationship with Christ and the church. It's very interesting how prejudice is the curious from the human being to know what will be happening. What will be happening? No? And we miss the present time to think in what will be happening. And these kind of prophecies are completely correct. And yeah, I, and I'm, to, I'm totally agree with you. And this misunderstanding create more chaos interpretation. What will be happening? Versus as a faithful people of God following the teaching of the church and guide us and lead us to the sacred scripture. All obviously well interpreted. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so this this really leads to, to to the second distinction, right? Which is that um, there's only one lady. So Our Lady of Fatima is Our Lady of Lords, is Our Lady of Guadalupe, is Mary of Nazareth. Like they're all the same person. It's not like there's 15 different virgins running around in heaven and then popping up periodically or something. Right. And the reason that's important is because we should expect consistency. Between the character of the Blessed Virgin as she appears in the scriptures, in the devotional and traditional life of the church, and, and, and in these Marian apparitions. And so, you know, when you hear a lady of Fatima asking people to fast on Wednesday and Friday, well, this shouldn't surprise anybody. That's just what Christians have done for most of history. We happen to live in a very lax period where people don't do that very well. But, right. like, but like, this isn't new. Like, it's, not, it's not like she just made this up or something, right? And so, um, you know, when she says things like, Pray for priests and the holiness of priests. Oh, this is this is a radically new idea. I meet Catherine of Siena, right? Like this is not this, this has been going on forever, right? And so, um, uh, you know, um, be opposed to godless regimes. In her case, communism. Yeah, this is not surprising, and was also the case for the nineteen hundred years that preceded it, right? So, so uh, I think trying to draw too hard of a distinction that make um, tr- trying to highlight the difference between Our Lady of Fatima and anything else is probably where the mistake comes. She needs to be read 
in a hermeneutic of continuity with the rest of the church's tradition. You mentioned a very important point, Father, also how we can include these prophecies into the life of the church. I mean, it's into the life of conversion. It must be accepted right now in preparation for the eternal life. But we can do consciously in acceptance and a humble manner the necessity to convert ourselves to God to accepting God in our life as well. That's right. You know, you, you, you've, we've got to be very careful how we read these things. Um, you know, uh, St. John Chrysostom, doctor of the Eastern Church, wrote some of the most beautiful Marian hymns that exist. He never called Our Lady Our Lady of Fatima. <laughs> Fatima wasn't even named Fatima yet because Ooh. Fatima is named after Muhammad's favorite daughter and she, she hadn't been born yet. Like, so, right. so, so, you, you know, um, and he didn't know about the, the promises of Our Lady to, with the rosary. Like that, that was a thing that was totally foreign to him. Do we really think John Chrysostom isn't in heaven because he didn't know about the particular devotional practice that we practice now? No, that's absurd, no. right? So, 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 so it's not like salvation is going to be uh, a, a, a condition, a, 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 a condition placed upon some extra promise or dispensation granted in a particular private revelation. That's not what these are for. What the revelations are intended to do uh, are unveil uh, little by little more and more the face of God uh, and so turn our hearts more and more fully toward Christ and his church. You describe beautifully that because, and unfortunately, this mass media, social media, had been distributed a lot of information in terms in terms of prophecy that create more confusion, misunderstanding, and a very colloquial interpretation about God's desire for the human being, and obviously lack of the clear and deeply exegesis and hermeneutic analysis about the Holy Scripture. May, may I have permission for 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 twenty <laughs> seconds to go on a rant, Father? I am convinced that the great vice of our age uh, is is curiosity. Right. Um, so curiositas, uh, this is not like Curious George, the friendly monkey who just wants to learn. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. And this is not some sort of censorship-minded anti-intellectualism. Um, but the, the reason I'm convinced curiosity is the vice of our age is because we have unfettered access to a wide array of knowledge in a way that we've simply not had in the course of human history. But in a way that in the past, knowledge has always been received in a particular order so that it can be built upon and grown in the same way that we teach children algebra before we teach them chemistry so that they can figure out how to do an equation. It's hard to do an equation if you don't know what a variable is, right? Right. Um, in that same sort of a way, we, we've just got loads of data, and that's we're really not built to think like that, right? So what the church historically is going to say is that, is that the, the, the virtue opposed to the vice of curiosity is docilitas. It's docility. Docilita, docility. Beautiful. And so docility is not, we think of this as like passive. It's not. It's, it's, it, it's deliberate and, and sort of focused action. So I'm, I, I'm docile to what's given me because I only need to know certain things. And the truth of the matter is, I don't need to know what Pope was in a vision some Polish nun had a hundred years ago that may or may not have gotten shot and may or may not have to do with the end of the world. I don't need to know that. That affects my salvation, not at all. You know what affects my salvation? Am I saying my prayers? Am I being good to other people? Am I going to confession? Am I, am I submissive to the church? Like those are the things that affect my salvation. Am I doing my job being faithful to my vocation? That is what affects my salvation. Iowa Catholic Radio, Be Not Afraid. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes Scotty McCreary with special guest Ali Colleen. Give myself five more Sunday, July 24th at the Iowa Event Center Ballroom. I'm in between Friday night wild and quiet Sunday morning. Tickets and information available at celebratecountry.org. Sponsored by Ball Team. Hello, I'm Sarah Herm, and I'm honored to share my story with you. Join me Thursday, June 2nd for the annual gala benefiting InterVisions Healthcare. I made a choice that I regretted, but I was able to reverse my chemical abortion. As a medical nonprofit, all proceeds from the event support the life-affirming work InterVisions provides abortion-minded women in need, women who find themselves in similar situations that I did just four years ago. For more information, visit IVHcare.org, and I look forward to meeting you on Thursday, June 2nd. 
Amazon Smile is a simple way to support Iowa Catholic Radio. When you are shopping on Amazon, consider shopping through Amazon Smile instead. You get all the same great deals, and your order will also help support Iowa Catholic Radio. All you need to do is choose Iowa Catholic Radio as your nonprofit to support when you first log in, and Amazon will do the rest. Every Amazon Smile order you make, Amazon will donate to Iowa Catholic Radio. Support Iowa Catholic Radio while you shop at smile.amazon.com. And thank you for supporting Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by CTO. What great news for donors to the Catholic Tuition Organization. You now receive 75%, yes, 75% of your donation back in Iowa tax credits beginning January 1st of this year. Your support has helped thousands of students attend our Catholic schools. Best gift ever. Online, ctoiowa.org. At CTO, the bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father, we're talking about these kind of prophecies, this kind of uh, spiritual interpretation from somebody, but also this curiosity before the break yeah, that you described beautifully and eloquent help us to understand that fragile tendency to be consistent in terms of our of our faith. In the first reading for this coming fifth Sunday of Easter, the Acts of the Apostles book, chapter 14, verses 21 to 27, enlighten us providentially this point. Could you please read, Father? Yeah, sure. After Paul and Barnabas had proclaimed the good news to that city and made a considerable number of disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They strengthened the spirits of the disciples and exhorted them to persevere in the faith, saying, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And they appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. Then they traveled through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. And after proclaiming the word at Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed on to Antioch, where they had been commended to by the grace of God for the work that they now accomplished. And when they arrived, they called the church together and reported what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And reported what God had done with them, Mm -hmm. not without them, Mm -hmm. with them. This is the manner how we can understand our Christian vocation. We are witnesses witnesses from God's mercy, ambassadors about the good news. A little bit different from any kind of prophecies, you know? Well, the other bit is, right, that it's... um, it's backward looking, right? Yeah. They reported what God had done. They're able to reflect on it because in a certain sense, this portion of the mission is completed. But the problem is, and this is, this is where, um, you know, our, our, our secular opponents will very often say, well, if you, if you act with this degree of certitude that you, like, you are 100% certain this is what God's always asking you to do, and that, then you're going to make some real bad mistakes and think that God told you to do it. Yeah, that's happened. Like I've done that personally, and certainly in the in the course of the church, we can point to this and say, yeah, that like, this is this 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 can produce a degree of arrogance unlike anything else. And and when we turn out wrong, it makes the whole faith incredible, unbelievable. And you don't want to do that to people. But what you can do with the benefit of hindsight is look backwards and say, oh yeah, no, look there, the finger of God was at work, even in ways I couldn't see at the time, as opposed to. Me having a feeling right now that I'm really, really certain this is God's will, even though I may well wind up wrong on the other end of it. Right. So you mentioned very, very sensitive line, you know, divine will. Mm -hmm. And divine will sometimes is not what I want to do, even if I have great good intentions, positive desires, is not necessarily working according to God's will. We, we we make a great mistake when we make God's will simply like or my we, my will plus, right? So like, so like it's my will plus plus God affirming it or something. Or contrary wise, and this is this is another temptation amongst the devout sometimes, um, and there are whole schools of spirituality that feed it. Um, God's will is necessarily the opposite of what I want. God always and only ever asks for the hardest possible thing. And, and if I enjoy it at all, or if I feel inclined toward it at all, or if I like what I'm doing, 
God must never be asking me to do this because God really wants me to be miserable. And sounds like a, a picky God, no? yeah. a picky God, you know, <laughs> like a, only, only wants to oh, bother me and not necessarily, you know, make him uncomfortable. This is why these act of the apostles have help us to understand in a pro, in a prophetic manner, more acceptance God's mission mm -hmm. and God's commitment. Versus my own desires or interpretation, what God want me to do. One of the things I think Pope Francis is really good about, he's got a, a number of very smart things to say about the Acts of the Apostles. He preached through them that first spring that he was Pope. And one of the things that he says is, we see in the Acts of the Apostles a, a sort of model for discernment in the early church. It's not like, you know, St. Peter is appointed the first Pope. And the Lord hands him the code of canon law and says, here are the outward bounds of your authority, and this is how you appoint bishops, and then this is what you do when bishops are bad, and this is how you handle bad priests. It's not like that. Or that St. Paul is given, you know, like the handbook for the, the, the congregation for evangelization or something, right? And then so he knows how to go set up churches in these other places. It's not like that. It's more God calling in the particular moments that they find themselves in. And then after the fact, they're able to reflect on that. Then they use the fruits of that reflection for the next mission, for the next act, right? But it's not like they've got a, a clear roadmap the whole time ahead. Absolutely. And we shouldn't expect to have it either. No, 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 no. One of the things that some people are a little bit confused is the head of the church and the hierarchical order of the church is not accidentally respond to listen the Holy Spirit, receive guidance from heaven, and then moving into the human being history of salvation as well, you know? Yeah, the, 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 you know, the Vatican II teaches very clearly that the church is an essentially hierarchically ordered communion. Now, American ears hear hierarchical, hear hierarchy, and we go, Arr, jerks, <laughs> right? Because we were, we were founded on this principle that, like, kings are bad. But here's the thing that, that like, Americans and English speakers often don't hear because they don't speak Greek. Um, hierarchy doesn't simply mean like organized one on top of another. Vertical. Right. Hierarchy, hierus is literally the word for priest. So it is a, it is a priestly ordered communion. Um, and that's not because the priests of the church are better, but it's because it is organized around the priesthood of Jesus Christ so that All who are part of the church share in the priesthood of Christ in one manner or another. The bishops, the overseers of the church, share in it most fully in a way that makes kind of sense. Otherwise, they couldn't oversee it, right? Correct. The presbyters, the priests, we are associated with the bishop's ministry and act as his sort of deputies out in the field. And the deacons assisting us in particular works, especially of service. The lay faithful are hierarchically ordered in the world, which is why their, um, their own presence in their offices, in their schools, in their shops, wherever they work, is the primary way that they offer sacrifice to Christ. And then what we do together as the gathered assembly is we offer Christ's own sacrifice together, bringing all that we do through the week to the Lord's altar to be made something new. This is a, a clear explanation how we must love docility, as you described, the opposite for curiosity, and also at the same time, Only expecting the good from God. Yeah. Only good from God. Father, we're approaching the ending of the program. Could you please send that with a more hope? Blessing. May the Lord, the giver of all good gifts, bless, keep, and sustain you, your homes and families. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Be not afraid. Iowa Catholic Radio. Be not afraid. Jesus is on the way to encounter you. Be not afraid is underwritten by Associated Ophthalmologists. 